There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, now for your long and listening pleasure. Okay. We are going to begin. We think it's recording to Zoom. There's no one there yet, but that's okay. We're just going to begin. Um, what I want to talk about today is what I want to talk about today. I'm gonna I'm gonna move over here. Yep. Put it up close to your mouth. Hello. Does that work? Okay. We'll see if I can do this. What we want to talk about today is um, I can just see. Okay. There's nothing quite like having the technology really kick you in the before you can even start. Okay. We're going to talk about desire and thirst and longing for God. So now, now it's not working again, Gary. Did you, did you hit that? I did. Oh, well, no, what it did was it, uh, it added that slide. Oh, it's very soon. There. It's going on. It's going on. Okay. This one. Okay. Hello. Here we go. At the core of every human being, is a desire and a thirst and a longing, sometimes called a restlessness or a dissatisfaction with the way things are, a dis-ease, a loneliness, a gnawing nostalgia. How's that for an alliteration with two different letters? A gnawing nostalgia. Um, some people, C.S. Lewis says this is a uh, a return to our home, uh, a home that we've never known, but that we want to go back to. Others call it a return to Eden, to a paradisical life of peace and purpose and fulfillment, satisfaction, what my therapist calls unconditional positive regard and acceptance. We all long for that. And Eden represents that state of being where we are unconditionally loved by God, restored to positive and creative relationship with ourselves, with God, with others in creation. And this then is that longing, that thirst that drives us all. And I want to thank the uh, worship committee, Sherry, for the very last line of the first stanza of our closing hymn. Moved by your love and toward your presence bent, far off yet here, the goal of all desire. God is the goal of all desire. So the interesting thing is C.S. Lewis says, um, here then is this desire still wandering and uncertain of its object and still largely unable to see that object in the direction where it really lies. We have this desire. We know we have this desire. And God put that desire in us to draw us to himself. So the desire is there and we look all around. Why am I desiring? Why am I longing? Why am I lonely? Why is this thing eating me up inside? And we look everywhere but to God. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless 
until they rest in you. And so this thirst, it's as simple as that, that we are made for relationship with God. And on this side of glory, we will remain thirsty until our thirst is met in him. And then we will thirst again. It reminds me of, of um, D.L. Moody. Now, D.L. Moody was an American evangelist, 19th century. He died in 1899. He was part of the Keswick uh, movement in the church at the time. Uh, Keswick, they believed in a second work of grace or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And a woman approached him one day and said, Sir, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, Yes but I leak. <laughs> and this is the nature of our lives. We are drawn by our thirst toward God. When we engage in relationship with him, we are satisfied. And then 10 minutes later, we're thirsty again. It's just the function and nature of life in a fallen planet. So, Quenching this thirst is actually the object of all spirituality, whether Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Hindu, Baha'i, or whatever branch on the, Christ, on the Christian tree you find yourself on, that spirituality has as its object meeting this thirst. So there's some things I want to point out. The Bible actually addresses this concept. <laughs> Who knew? As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. When shall I come behold the face of God? And in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. We sometimes don't grasp because we live in the Pacific Northwest where it's green and it rains all the time. We don't conceptualize what it's like to live in a desert. But the Bible took place in a desert. So when they reference a dry and thirsty land, they're not talking about here. They're talking about a desert. I stretch out my hands to you, my soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Now, the other interesting thing in this is, is secondly, so first the Bible addresses it. Secondly, we often feel that because we have this longing and this thirst, that there's something wrong with us, that somehow we are inadequate or insufficient or, the, uh, or uh, because we thirst, we're insufficient. We feel as though our thirst highlights some failing in us, some defectiveness or incompetence. But that is not the case. Let's look at Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. That's kind of... Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fair. Now, there's some things I really want to point out here. The first point is this. God knows you're thirsty and he does not condemn you for it. God accepts it as a fact of life. Again, he likely put it there to draw us to himself. And thus, because he doesn't condemn us for it, he invites us um, to, where, to where that thirst, sorry. He invites the thirsty to come and be satisfied in him. The fact that he invites us is evidence that this thirst can be quenched. However, temporarily, it can be met. God is not the kind of person to make empty promises and cruel invitations. 
to invite you to have that thirst met and then go, oh, you're dry. <laughs> he doesn't do that. That this invitation from God exists is evidence that he wants to try and meet that thirst. Now, please note, God invites everyone in the Hebrew where he says, oh, everyone that thirsteth, that everyone means everyone. Because all humans have that thirst. The invitation isn't to a select few who have their act together or to those few who are super spiritual or, or have the right training and the right education. Uh, no, he invites everyone because he knows everyone is thirsty. And God initiates. If you looked at that verse, at least in the NIV, he invites us to come four times. So God initiates. And it's a remarkable invitation because he acknowledges our need, yet preserves our dignity by saying, come, buy. It's a metaphor of the marketplace. We don't have to grovel and beg to have our thirst quenched. It's a marketplace. There's a transaction. He says, come, buy and eat without cost. And what he's saying there is that we are invited to come and to buy without having to beg for it. And we come and, and the with our thirst and he invites us to the market where we can see, receive the water, the milk, the wine, the bread that we need. And yet the money of exchange is not our own, but the currency of his grace. Now, so there's this promise from God. He knows we're thirsty, he doesn't condemn us, and he invites us in grace to come receive that thirst or that quenching of the thirst. But not everybody does it. Even at that invitation, some will balk and not respond. So consider Jeremiah 2, 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living waters, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now you have to realize in Jeremiah's time and in that dry land, there were three places where they could get water. One was a stream, and most villages found their, their, their founding near a stream. And a stream, because it was moving, was called living water. It was continually refreshed. It was living water. And that was where the best uh, water that a, a village could have. And it was easy to access, right? It's right there, and it was always fresh. The second choice was a well. They had to dig a well. It took some effort. And then they had to have the mechanical system of getting the water up out of the well to where they needed it. But that's still not as bad as a cistern. Now a cistern is basically a rain barrel, except a rain barrel maybe the size of this room, that collects water during the rainy season, stores it, and then they access it during the dry season. So that water sits there for months before they can access it. Cisterns were simply plastered tanks for capturing the rainwater. Um, they were relatively easy to construct, but they had significant drawbacks. They were only useful after a good rain, the water could become stale, it could become contaminated, and they could develop cracks in the plaster where the water would drain out. But again, please note, God does not condemn them for being thirsty. He just says what they've done, he's criticizing how they go about meeting their desire. So what is a broken cistern? A broken cistern is anything other than God that temporarily satisfies or quenches your thirst. And we all have our favorites. Is it money, food, alcohol, <coughs> drugs, sex, work, family, 
friends, entertainment, amusement. We talked about this word before, remember amusement? Ah, muse, meant. Ah, meaning not. Muse, meaning thinking. Not thinking. That's what amusement is, is not thinking. We go to yeah. avoid what's in our head. Success, sports, reputation, church. Now, are some of those things I just listed legitimate? Yeah, absolutely. And when we turn to them to fill that longing in us, we delegitimize them. When we turn to them instead of to God to quench that thirst. We've got to realize that too often we operate out of the conviction that we know better than God on how to meet our longing. And we must constantly remind ourselves that turning to God to meet our thirst may cost us convenience, but never costs us joy. And a lot of those other things that we can turn to can cost you joy. So just to summarize thus far, everyone is legitimately thirsty. Satisfying the thirst is the task of all spirituality. God acknowledges the thirst. God does not condemn the thirsty. God offers to satisfy the thirsty. And yet sometimes we satisfy that thirst the wrong way. Now, well, I have been on a journey the last 10 months of of addressing my diabetes, losing weight, eating better, trying to take care of myself, not be so depressed all the time. And I've learned some things about thirst. So first, we often mistake our thirst for hunger, okay? <laughs> Clinical studies have shown that 30%, 37% of people mistake thirst for hunger because the thirst signals can be relatively weak. And when we're dieting, this is especially problematic because you go to the fridge or the pantry for some chips, cookies, or Cheetos. <laughs> and even if you're, even I go, sometimes I go to the fridge for Celery and carrot sticks and those little sweet pickles. But you know what? Most of the time when I go to the fridge, I'm not hungry, I'm thirsty. And I'm just not paying attention to the signal. You must not wait until you're feeling the thirst to satisfy it. Uh, because staying hydrated is critical to, um, where am I? You must not wait until you're, until you're feeling thirst in order to drink water. Staying hydrated throughout the day helps curb your cravings, keeps you alert, helps digestion. And while severe dehydration isn't likely to affect you on a normal day, you become mildly dehydrated when your body's fluid levels drop just one to 3%. One doctor who advises pilots says you should not be piloting an aircraft from a one seat glider to an airliner. You should not be piloting an aircraft if you're as little as one to 2% dehydrated because our bodies are mostly water and because water is so essential to proper functioning of all our organs, but especially our brains, our brains are 95% water. And if you're dehydrated 3%, you're only at about 95% uh, effectiveness and you're gonna make bad decisions. And in the air, that can be really dangerous. Hunger and thirst are actually processed in the same part of the brain and that's why we mistake the signal. And in one recent study, this is scary. They found that individuals responded appropriately by drinking water when they were thirsty, but not hungry, only 2% of the time. All the rest of the time, 
they were they ate when they were thirsty, or they didn't eat or drink when they were thirsty or hungry. They ate or drank when they weren't thirsty or hungry, which is usually my problem. I eat because I'm bored. They drank when they were hungry, but not thirsty. And they ate when they were thirsty, but not hungry. So 98% of the time we get it wrong. Mm. So what does it mean for us spiritually? We say, I'm not thirsty. What that means is, um, what you don't realize is that you've probably suppressed that signal that your body's sending. And if you ignore it long enough, it just goes away until you're really, really dehydrated. There was one day last spring, it was in June, I think. And I realized, wow, I'm just thirsty, I'm really thirsty. And I drank a whole glass of water, 16 ounces. And I was still thirsty. So I drank another one. This went on, I drank five glasses of water. And the scary thing, you guys, I never had to pee afterwards. I was so dehydrated. I didn't have to go to the bathroom after drinking all that water. All of it was absorbed. Sometimes we say, I don't like water. Which, or I like my water as tonic with gin. <laughs> and why would our bodies tell us to reject what we need so desperately? It's because we've developed a preference against it. It's just that simple. We have altered our palates to crave different flavors and different sensations, like sweet or salty or alcoholic or carbonated beverages. And so we ignore all the free water at our tap or in our fridge that most of the world would kill to have. We ignore it and we drink wine instead. Well, I won't say we, I will say I drink wine instead, which just makes me thirstier because it dehydrates you. And then I think, oh, I'm thirsty. I'll have another glass of wine. And that's a bad cycle, you guys. Really bad. Or sometimes we say, well, I forget to drink. And this is because our lives are filled with distractions that knock us off our natural drinking cycle. For most people, we only drink something when we eat, right? Three times a day. That is driven by society and culture, not biology. Your biology wants to drink all day long. So we subconsciously limit our drinking times to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we need to rehydrate all day long. So. What do you need to do? Quit suppressing the signal. Recalibrate, recalibrate your palate. And don't wait for meal times to drink. Now, can we draw spiritual ramifications here? Yes. Quit suppressing the signal. Acknowledge you are thirsty, that you have desire, that you have longings, that you're lonely, that that gnawing nostalgia is eating you up inside. Just admit it. We all know you have it. And we know that we have it. So just admit it. Next, recalibrate your palate. Stop turning to broken cisterns. Because they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna quench your thirst temporarily and probably give you bad breath in the process. And don't wait for meal times to drink. Find ways to incorporate God into your daily schedule. Now, this is really interesting. In monastic traditions, they found ways to pray on a regular cycle through the, the praying of liturgical hours: morning, noon, uh, evening, vespers, compline. They just they they just regularly scheduled it so their people would pray all day long. But there's lots of ways to do this. You don't have to, you know, sit down and pray the hours every day. You could start in the morning 
with prayer and with reading your Bible and devotions. Others, like my wife, journals every morning. And I get up and stumble to the coffee pot. She's already been up for an hour and written in her journal. And I'm just like still trying to wake up. It takes discipline and consistency to build a habit. So as I was wrestling with this and thinking about it, how do I align my spirituality with my thirst? And we all have this thirst, and this legitimate, placing us by God to draw us to us to himself. Quenching that thirst of the, is the object of our spirituality. What should our spirituality look like in order to quench that thirst? And just like everything, Jesus is our example. Now, so the question is, did Jesus experience thirst? Yeah, he did. He was all God, all man, and a little bit schizophrenic, I think. Because he was these two things, all God and all man. But what did he do? He went out to a deserted place to pray. And different scholars have looked at the life of Christ and, and tried to identify what are the spiritual practices that Jesus engaged in? And some say there was nine, some say there was six, some say there was five, some say there was just three. It all depends on who you read. But what we do know is he did prayer, fasting, public worship, Bible reading, solitude and silence. And when he tells us, go into a secret place to pray, that's the same as saying, practice solitude and silence. Which for me, my number one strength is input and silence is the hardest thing for me to deal with. That's why I need to do it more. So Jesus told his disciples, remember Matthew uh, 5 through 7, the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 1 says, he went up to the top of the mountain and it says his disciples went with him. Now in all the paintings and the pictures, we see massive crowds at the mountain, right? That's not what Matthew 5, 1 says. It says he went up the mountain, his disciples went with him, and he sat down and began to teach them. And Matthew 5 goes through all the, the Beatitudes. And then he goes on in Matthew 6, and he starts to give them very specific instructions. Some of those instructions are things like almsgiving, what we would call social justice, helping the poor, private prayer, which is always linked with private morality, communal spirituality, and what I'm going to call just being present to the moment. We're going to take these apart in all the different verses that we're looking at. So almsgiving in, in um, there. So whenever you give alms, don't sound a trumpet, blah, 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 blah. But when you give alms, do not, let your le do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Oh my. Okay, so. Please note. This term almsgiving is a catch-all term for what we would now call social justice. And uh, <laughs> it's profound that Jesus says when, not if. And much of the church takes this as if. Now, bless you Lutherans. You guys are all about social justice. But you got to know. <laughs> um, I just, I'll tell you a story. I was raised right in conservative fundamental evangelicalism. We did not believe in social justice. That's what the liberals do. We don't do that. And that causes them to be engaged in the world. And the world will contaminate you. In fact, <clears throat> one of the lights of evangelicalism, a guy named Oswald Chambers. Have you ever seen a little devotional he wrote by utmost first highest? Yep. Yeah, you, you ex-evangelicals, you know what I'm oh, talking yeah. about. You've seen it? Oh, well, that's the same. 
You're so the Missouri Synod was really con conservative. They're like Baptists, right? Oswald Chambers said this, the central point of the kingdom of Jesus Christ is personal relationship with him, not public usefulness to man. And we bought into that. And, and probably 12 to 14 years ago, I had this kind of boom, epiphany and I started to let references to social justice creep into my sermons and my teaching. And so did another brother in the church. There was a couple of us that were kind of pushing this agenda. And the senior pastor's wife, I think I told you this story before. The senior pastor's wife came up to me after a service and she said, now remember, she's the co-pastor of the church. She said, where are you guys getting all this widows and orphans stuff? And I just laughed. I thought she was joking. And she said, I'm serious. And then I got serious. And I said, well, you start with the major prophets and then you go into the minor prophets and then you go into the gospels because it's all over there. And she goes, I just don't see it. What are you going to do? So I left that church. <laughs> um, but the killer on this, okay, so I'm new to the social justice world. And I feel like I'm doing a good job. <laughs> and then you read it and Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I got it. It took me 15 years to get here, and now you're saying it's got to be secret? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> now, there, there's two potential errors when we uh, talk about social justice and almsgiving. One is to not give it proper place in our attention and efforts. And that's where most evangelicals are. That's where I was for most of my adult life. The flip side is to make it so prominent in our activity that it isn't secret. Now, the question is, how do you become engaged in social justice and have it be a secret? Well, actually you can't. That's not his point. His point is motivation. What is your motivation for doing it? Because if our motivation is look at me, then the, our risk is doing social justice for the purpose of virtue signaling and being seen doing it. And that's almost just as bad as not doing it at all. Now, if I feed the poor and I do it flagrantly, are the poor fed? Yes. Will I get a reward? Not a chance. So it is better to do it even if you have poor motivation than to not do it because the people will be fed. But you're missing the point. Okay. That's the first part of, of Matthew 6. The next part, he says, whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand in the street, in synagogues in the street corners so that they may be seen. But whenever, whenever, you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father in secret. And your father who's in secret sees it and will reward you. So some things to note here. First is, again, just like almsgiving, not if you do it, but when you do it. And I think too many of us read this wrong. We read, well, if I pray, I'll do it secretly. That's not what Jesus said. He said, when you pray. And the purpose of this prayer is relationship with the Father. Because you're praying to the Father in secret. This is a private, personal relationship with God through Jesus. And it's how we perform the first and greatest commandment, which is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And interestingly enough, elsewhere in the Gospels, in John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, 
you will keep my commandments. So in the Gospels, fidelity in keeping the commandments, that is private morality, is the only real criterion to tell real prayer from illusion. If I don't behave myself in private, my prayers mean nothing. I have to have enough integrity to behave myself all the time. Yes, Phyllis. Would you comment um, on the quote of Jesus that was on the previous screen that said, the Father who sends in secret will reward you? Would you comment on what the reward is? I think it's he'll quench your thirst. He'll meet that desire and that longing. I wouldn't be looking for much else, personally. Just to have my thirst quench would be sufficient for me. Other rewards may come later in heaven. I'm not counting on that. Good question. So private prayer and private morality are linked. How am I loving God and how am I loving my neighbor? Now, interestingly enough, there are two camps of thought on private prayer as relationship with Jesus. One camp says, duh, of course, private prayer and personal relationship with Jesus is a central focus of Christian spirituality. And this includes, honestly, most evangelicals, most Roman Catholics. They say, this is, this is what you have to do to have relationship with Jesus, pray. There are another, There is another camp, though, for all kinds of reasons, which includes many Christians in our culture and liberal Christians in particular that do not share that view. And actually within liberal Christianity and within the secular culture as a whole, there is a certain fear that having a too privatized relationship with Jesus is dangerous and that it's something that takes you away from true religion. So this over privatization of spirituality. There are real dangers in the over privatization of spirituality. The spiritual life is not just about you and Jesus on the Jericho Road. Remember that song? Oh, it's a good gospel. Just you and Jesus on the Jericho Road, just you two and no more. There's only room for two. You never sang that song? Bless my Baptist tennis. <laughs> um, because that, that was the thinking. There's just room for two, just me and Jesus. That's really all I can handle. However, there are equal dangers in not having enough of just you and Jesus. If we lack sufficient and proper interiority and intimacy with God, it's easy to go about our days thirsty and turn Christianity into an ideology and a philosophy and a moral code and ultimately missing what Christianity is all about and certainly not finding our thirst quenched in God. This is a very fine needle to thread. Can you do too much either way? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's probably a pendulum in all of our hearts that just swings back and forth. Then, so after, after he talks to them about private prayer, he says, so pray this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. And then he goes on in verse 14. This is um, 9 through 13. Verse 14, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hmm. This is where it comes in handy, the discipline of not reading what's there. Okay? Jesus could have provided an explication on the Father's name and the hallowedness of it. He could have talked about um, what is meant by the kingdom and its coming. He could have talked about our daily bread. 
what kind of bread should we be eating? He could have talked about the necessity or, or uh, addressing us in our time of trial, but what's he talk about? Forgiving others. Why? Just look at this. Our Father, us, us, our, we, our, us, us. He's saying your spirituality is a communal spirituality. We're all in this together. Jesus expects us to exercise our spirituality in the setting of a concrete community. Now, this is because how we relate to others is just as important as how we relate to God. In fact, how we relate to others is how we relate to God. For Jesus, the two great commandments, to love God and love your neighbor, can never be separated. He said the first, or the second is like unto the first. They're together. You can't love God and not love your neighbor. You have to do both. The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. Some of those people are a pain in the yeah. neck. <laughs> Some of those people do their best to drive you crazy. And they, some of them do evil things. But what does Jesus say to us? Love them anyway. Why? Because you need love anyway. Schlermacher says that the individual quest of God, however sincere that search, that individual lives an unconfronted life. Which is to say part of our purpose in communal life is to experience the checks and balances to our actions, to be confronted when we're wrong. Is that fun? No, no, it's not fun. But without community, we have more of a private fantasy than a real faith. Real conversion demands that eventually the recipient of real conversion uh, be involved in both the muck and grace of actual church life. Spirituality, that search to quench our hearts, the search to quench our hearts thirst is ulti ultimately communitarian in its nature because we are all in this together. Then Jesus says at the end of that chapter, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And the King James says, sufficient to each day is the evil thereof. Which is to say, every day has some evil, some trouble. I like it, though, in the Message Bible. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Then don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. So for our purposes, I'm going to call this simply being present in the moment. This is actually a spiritual discipline, being present in the moment. Don't be so caught up in the issues of the world in social justice issues, political issues, environmental issues, or world events that we cannot allow ourselves to be present and enjoy the present moment without guilt, shame, anger, bitterness, or fear. For instance, Matthew 26, six through eight, when the woman broke the alabaster jar of ointment and poured the perfume on Jesus's head and the disciples said, oh my God, we could have sold that and fed the poor. What was Jesus' response as present to the moment in the woman's heart? He said, leave her alone. She's doing a good work. And wherever this gospel is shared, she will be remembered. He said, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. So be present to the moment. 
or when the prodigal son's older brother was upset when everyone was celebrating the return of the prodigal, but he refused to be present to the joy of his father. He refused to be present to the heart of his father. He refused to be present to the party. Instead, he sat outside in the darkness of his bitterness and anger because he felt that he had been treated unfairly. He had an ungrateful heart. Gustavo Gutierrez, the father of liberation theology, suggests that to have a healthy spirituality, we must feed our souls in three ways, through prayer, through private and communal prayer, through the practice of social justice, and through having those things in our lives, such as good friendships, wine drinking, creativity, and healthy leisure. These are things Gustavo said, not me. <laughs> I'm like, amen, brother, preaching. <laughs> because those things help keep the soul mellow and grateful. Rollheiser, another uh, Catholic uh, scholar, calls this um, not a mellow soul, but a mellowness of heart. And I call it just being grateful. It is impossible to remain grateful when we're focusing on all the bad things around us and when we rationalize that our causes are so urgent or that we are so wounded or that our world is so bad that in our situation, any angerness and bitterness are more justified than gratefulness for the grace and goodness of God. It reminds me of the story. This guy dies and he goes to heaven. And St. Peter's giving him a tour. And he sees a bunch of people over in the corner standing like this. And, and he says, Peter, what's up with those guys? And Peter says, ah, those are the Baptists. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> they're missing the party. Larry Crabb says, God is a party happening and I'm invited. How many of us live with that kind of gratefulness and joy? We live concerned about so many things, the past, the future, and we miss the joy and the gratefulness of the presence. So, be present in the moment to the grace and goodness of our lives. Okay. I think of Jesus this way. Not hard or crystalline or fragile, but rather multifaceted. And each facet reflects an aspect of his divine nature, and each facet reflects an aspect of his human nature. And God's goal for us is to be like him multifaceted. And these four things that we've talked about today that engage and reflect our spirituality, social justice, private prayer, private morality, communal spirituality, and being present to the moment are ways in which we can not only quench our thirst for God, but also ways in which we image Jesus because he did these things too. And he told his disciples in Matthew 6, this is what I want you to do. Now, are there more ways to quench the thirst? More facets and more ways we can legitimately quench that thirst? Yeah, of course. Of course, there's lots of spiritual practices we can engage in. And, and when we do that, we reflect the very heart of God. All it takes is time and attention. So, remember what Mr. Rogers said? Can you do this? Yes, you can. You can do this. Because this is what I know about you. You 27 people, I know one thing about you. As evidenced by your presence in the room, I know this about you. 
your desire for more of God than you have right now, and your longing for love, your need for deeper levels of spiritual transformation than you have experienced so far is the truest thing about you. Not your sin, not your woundedness, not your giftedness or your personality type or your job title or your identity as a husband, wife, mother, father that somehow defines you. But in reality, it is your desire for God and your capacity to reach for more of God than you have right now that is the deepest essence of who you 27 people are. So as we roll through the next couple of weeks, through Palm Sunday and into Holy Week and all its activities, pay attention to your thirsts. They can be subtle, gentle nudges in your spirit. But as you acknowledge them and as you seek God for the quenching of that thirst and drink of his presence, and as you turn away from your broken cisterns, God will meet you because the truest thing about you is your hunger for him. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. Unless anyone has anything to add. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. Yes. I guess, it, you know, sometimes it's a matter of semantics, but I see this hunger, this thirst. It has really a gift of the spirit. I think it is a gift. You know, yeah. it's not something that, that I do, you know, or that I even can recognize. And it's when I'm open to the spirit's work that, um, that, that I can recognize that. Yeah, I, I think... Um, I think we can acknowledge it. And I think it is a gift from God. And our our responsibility, if you will, is to respond to it. That's why in the Psalms, when David says, I long for you, I thirst for you. And then he goes on for the whole rest of the Psalm talking about God. This is a really fine line between uh, grace and works. And let me say it this way. Um, Dallas Willard, and I've said this before, you've probably heard me say this. Dallas Willard says, God is not opposed to our effort. God is opposed to our earning. We think if I read my Bible in the morning, I've earned brownie points with God. No. You, you ain't earned jack. But you should still put forth the effort. And this is where I, I perhaps differ with all you good Lutherans. And I think you actually, you all do the effort, but you think it's just grace. Okay, semantics. Fine. But we got to do something. We can't just sit on our chairs all day <laughs> and and expect God to do everything he expects us to do stuff too when God put Adam and Eve in the garden he put them there to tend it and keep it that is to put forth effort before the fall our job was to put forth effort so it's not about earning. And you're absolutely right about that. It's not about earning. It's about receiving and responding. Um, elsewhere in the scriptures, I was just reading this yesterday. I think it's in, I think it's in First John. We love him because he first loved us. We respond to his love. We respond to his grace. We didn't initiate that. He initiated that. And our, our, our role, if you will, 
is to respond. And I don't view that respond as earning. It's just we respond. It's about a relationship. Yeah. And it's not a transactional relationship, but it is a relationship. Yeah. Pastor Dara. Yeah. Right. I think the, the concept of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Is a gift, and as a gift, we are given, and we really mess it up when we change the word "gift" to "gift." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm. I'm uh, I apologize. If I've offended your Lutheran sensibilities, <laughs> I am Lutheran ish. <laughs> yes. So, uh, what I have to say is, you're more Lutheran all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I feel like what I grew up as a key Lutheran thing is that the works, the social justice, all the stuff we do is a response yeah. to understanding. And maybe sometimes we talk too much about grace, but that last part you said, that was very good. Okay. Um, if I had been born and raised in Germany, and for most of my life spoke German, when I came here to speak to you today, it would be with a German accent. So I come to you today to speak to you with an evangelical accent. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Please forgive me for speaking with that accent. <laughs> the thing I love about being Lutheran is your emphasis on grace. First time I ever felt and realized grace was in a Lutheran church. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So before we shut the Zoom, we'll move to the Zoom. Yeah, go to Zoom. Well, yeah, you got one what are the problems? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, just just go over and see if everything comes down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, who's down here? Yeah. So go here. And uh, stop recording. Yeah. yeah. And then it says. Okay, so yeah, so.